Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 307 for July 5th, 2017. New gear and super stations. Hey, good evening, everybody. It is Wednesday night. It's actually like 22 minutes past the hour. We're a little bit late. And if you were watching the live stream uh, before the show, you got to see 20 minutes of George trying to find the on switch to the microphone and Brian putting my face and mouth on various things. That didn't sound right. Well, you missed it if you didn't. If you're not watching live, you missed it. And that's a good reason why you should watch the show live on Wednesday nights because we have fun. And now, quite frankly, I'm exhausted. So good night, everybody. No, really, we've got a, we got a big show for you tonight. Bob Heil is not here. He's the smart one of the bunch. He decided to take the night off. And he's left the uh, inmates in charge of the asylum. So let's go around the horn and see who we've got. We have, uh, just to my north, we have with a special guest, uh, George, W5JDX. Uh, special guest in Shack tonight, Mr. Icom himself. Hello, George and Ray. Hello, Don. Good to be here tonight. I think I'll have to double check and make sure that I made it. But uh, we almost didn't see you there with that shirt on. I mean, it, it was like almost a blank screen there for a moment. Ray, how have you been? Blank screen, blank looks, all in the <laughs> same. Doing well, making my way across the country and uh, come down here to play with a couple new radios with you and Tommy later this week. And uh, thank you for inviting me to come over. Well, you're welcome. It's good to have you here. Good to see you again. We don't get to visit with you as much, so we'll be back a little later in the show and, and hang yep. out some. All right. And Ray has a great Ray has a really nice new RV because he's moving to Texas if you haven't heard and I love the nickname for the RV the the QRV is that what I saw on Facebook you're calling it the QRV I don't know who came up with that one but I don't think so <laughs> I heard, thought I I've saw heard that. various <laughs> names I have heard I th- various names called of it some by the people trying to pass us going up long hills and <laughs> yeah. then a few other ones well, Yeah I Been there and done that. We went to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and we had a 29-foot Class C. And uh, we went up to the observation tower. The sign said, no vehicles over 30 feet. I looked at my wife and I said, we're 29. We're going. And we did. So, uh, yeah, those those are fun. We'll drive safe. And uh, uh, welcome back down to the south. I know you're a lot closer to home down, down here in Texas. So welcome back. We'll check back with George and Ray here in a little bit. Somebody else who is uh, uh, actually to because... Ray is a visitor in Georgia's shack tonight. Val is a visitor in someone else's shack. So, Val, how are you tonight? Good, good. Yeah, I'm out on my world tour uh, here at K9CT place. place. Uh, Craig Thompson, a big-time de-expeditioner and a contester, and we are at a world-class contesting station. And uh, we're going to be talking about station autom- automation, among a bunch of other things. So we're going to be on a little later in the show. So hope you stay tuned for that. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about here. Good deal. Craig, good to have you on the show tonight. We'll be back with you guys here in just a little bit. We covered a story on on, uh, on Amateur Radio Newsline, or Will, if we haven't yet, about uh, the Hamfesters Radio Club. They're having a ham fest coming up in August. It's their 83rd, 83rd annual. So if you're up in the Chicagoland area at Piatone, uh, you want to check this out because that's going to be just a lot of fun. The Hamfesters Radio Club, 83rd annual Hamfest. Wow, that's longevity. And uh, I've got a little bit of news that I'll share with you here before we go over to uh, to Gordon at Costa Mesa. I will be uh, the invited guest 
at the Oklahoma City Ham Fest coming up. Oh, the uh, the weekend of uh, it's it's uh, it's July 21st and 22nd, Friday and Saturday night. I'll be speaking at the at the banquet and hanging around the Saturday at the Ham Fest. So if you're going to be in Oklahoma City, come by and say hi. I would love to meet you. It's going home for me because I'm an Oklahoma City native and uh, they were kind enough to uh, invite me and make it possible for me to be there. And so uh, thank you all to the folks at uh, at the uh, at the Oklahoma City uh, Ham Fest Ham Holiday. Ham Holiday. Uh, Brian Gordon, and throw that uh, website up real quick, and then we'll go over and see what Gordon's got to say. But hamholiday.com is the website if you want to check it out. It's uh, They're in a brand new venue this year. There it is. Really nice hotel. And if you go down where it says Friday Banquet, you'll see the information there where uh, where they're, uh, they've had a lapse in judgment, and they're bringing me in. So there you go. Hamholiday.com. Go and check them out and come by and say hi. It's going to be so nice to be back in the Sooner State. It's been several years since we were there, and I cannot wait. So uh, very good. And uh, Gordon, something you have been instrumental in in, in providing uh, some uh, materials and uh, well wishes for the boy. The boy will be testing for technician coming up on the 15th at the Slidell Louisiana Ham Fest. So uh, looking forward to Tyler joining the ranks of the hams and he's already picked out a vanity call so uh, there you go gordon thanks for your help and support with that and uh, what's going on in costa mesa tonight my friend well all is well we had a super july 4th uh, last night it was like the entire city was uh, lit up and a lot of aerial fireworks much beyond what the uh, fire marshal would permit but uh, they were all over the sky so all is well at this end back to you don Good deal. Well, why don't you go ahead and jump right into your short shots and let us know what's going on in the world of ham radio uh, in Gordo's world. Roger that. And following up a week after your Oklahoma Ham Fest get together, the Central States BHF Society is holding their conference out here in Albuquerque on July 27, 28, 29, and 30. And I know all you HFDXers go, you know, uh, DX on uh, VHF. Well, we're going to talk about what happened last Friday, but the weekend before the Hawaiian beacon was in. So let's take a look and see what happens beyond just tropospheric duct tape. There's our letter C. Well, it's up about 100 kilometers, and that is our E layer. And uh, the D layer is at night. The uh, E layer, excuse me, the D layer is during the day and disappears at night, the D layer. The E layer is eccentric, and the furthest up are the F1 and F2 layers. Now, you can't see the ionospheric layers, but there are some folks, especially VHFers, that say we can see when we're going to have some E skip, sporadic E. So let's take a look and see what sporadic E First of all, it occurs about 100 kilometers up, and it's always occurring in July uh, and August and uh, sometimes in June. Well, let me tell you, last Friday, it hit big time the very first of July. Big time activity with sporadic E. Oh, yeah, there's also some sporadic E around uh, the winter time as well. That's the letter C. Um, it's up in the E layer where sporadic E clouds will form. And these E clouds contain uh, uh, ions. They contain metal ions, iron, magnesium, sodium, and calcium. And they're up there at about 100 kilometers. And many times they'll rise up and come in as a group. Well, we had a group this past Friday. And let me tell you what a deal. And it was all happening thanks to a sporadic E cloud that most affects 10 meters, 6 meters, 2 meters, 220, even as high as 432. Very rarely, but yes. So the E layer is where all the excitement is for VHF and UHF. Not the weather layer. Right here, you're taking a look at the weather layer. And while there are some that say you can get some enhancement of 2 meters and 220, 432, at an approaching uh, weather storm, especially in the Midwest and back east. Um, the rest of the time, weather really does not affect VHF and UHF propagation. Well, sometimes lightning may uh, give us some brief opening. Sometimes huge thunderclouds will give us a bounce on 10 gigahertz. 
But normally, it's not the visual weather that's going to give us the fireworks in June and July, thanks to sporadic heat. So let's take a look and see what's happening. Well, a thin sporadic E layer formed up over Colorado, right over um, uh, the uh, Colorado border. And that sporadic E cloud stayed in place. And it was more than a cloud. Someone said it was a sporadic E major mass. Well, whatever we call it, it was there and it stayed in place. And what occurs is 10 meters and higher will begin to reflect, not refract, but reflect off that thin sporadic E cloud. And that cloud may only be one kilometer thick and only three to five kilometers long. And uh, that cloud may take on different well, we knew something was happening last Friday when the 10 meter band began to look like this. Look at the spectrum scope and you'll see there was signals just galore. 10 meters absolutely opened up. Well, that happens a lot. But we began listening and we heard the band opening on 10 meters get shorter and shorter. And when the band openings get shorter, that means there's a likelihood that the six meter band and maybe even higher will begin to bounce off that sporadic E. Well, the 10 meter band was certainly going crazy as you could see by some of the DX spots. I know Valerie would like that one. Um, but up at 50.125, and this is on the ICOM 9100 that we worked all the fireworks last Friday. Ray, it was working great. I was hearing stations all over the place. Six meters began to come in. And when six meters began to get shorter and shorter, as evidenced by this on Friday, we're not seeing coast to coast, but rather we're seeing double hop on six meters. So we began to listen intently on the two meter band. Now, who would think that we'd ever get skip on the two meter band? Well, skip normally occurs, sporadic E skip, starting about seven or eight in the morning, peaks about nine or 10, and then there's a peak about sundown. But this was like two in the afternoon. What in the world is going on? We have an FM receiver that has a pan adapter, and the FM band had not only the LA stations, but absolutely double and tripling with other stations on top of the local FM music band. I mean, things were going nuts. The UHF television band was acting very strange. All this happening this past Friday. And when we looked at the band scope, Wow, look at all the signals, and that's a big mama signal right there. It is so important that you have a band scope on the rig that if you're looking for DX, you can just look at it, keep the volume all the way down, and you don't have to uh, hear a thing. Although I do like the clear speaker because the clear speaker will go ahead and cancel a lot of that background white noise, uh, the crackles. Well, we were listening and listening, and... Um, uh, others with their receivers were looking at the pan adapter. And all of the major manufacturers now have great pan adapter receivers. And uh, as we were looking and looking, all of a sudden we heard this come up on the air. That was Oregon pouring in, and we could not believe it on the two-meter band. Oregon must have had a huge antenna. Not a big antenna, just a 12-element Yagi. Wow, what a deal. So there was our first uh, indication that the two-meter band was about ready to open big time. Then later on, it got bigger and bigger. And thanks to Chip, K7JA. And here's Chip calling a call. Uh, 225, Mike, Mike. Go, Delta, Zulu, so here we have two stations coming in. One from Idaho and one from Oregon, W7MEM. And then finally, in zero, Lima, Lima, that uh, came back uh, to this station. Well, Chip worked more stations than I did, but he's a great operator on CW as well. 
So the two meter band, as you can see there, was really hopping. One of the best contacts was double hop. That's where the signal goes up, bounces off a cloud, may come back down to earth, or it may just go to the next cloud over. And where did the double hop end up? Wow, look at that. Pacific Northwest all the way down to Mississippi on two meters. And this is not just for a few seconds. This is for an hour on end. So sporadic E uh, does not require a huge antenna like this, but it helps. The sporadic E from six meters can go up to two meters and even higher. Report has been 432 is the highest. So with these antennas, and uh, Brian, you can come back to me, uh, we were able to work some mighty good DX. So wow, that is neat that we have these kind of conditions. So if you're a technician class operator and you go, yeah, you know, I'm getting tired of FM and some of the digital work, hop on up to sporadic E. The Lycom 7300 with that band scope and you will be rolling. So now let's check in, I believe, with George. And uh, George, you've got a very special guest. That's Ray at ICOM America. George? Yeah, it's, it's not a very special guest. It's just Ray. <laughs> <laughs> he is special. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for that loving welcome here. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, I, should, I should be better. He brought toys. I was thinking about leaving them for a while, too, but oh, I don't well. know about that now. Yeah. Well, we tried tying you up with that crime scene tape here. Uh, I think when we did a review of the uh, 7300 yeah, is when that, we did that. That didn't work too didn't well. Didn't work. Nope. So Tommy's coming back tomorrow night. We're going to shoot some video of these two ratings here. Right. I've got a logging chain and a padlock, so uh, maybe... You know, maybe we can keep one of these. Just, just tell us, what have you been up to? You've, you've been on the road. They, they've been keeping me busy with doing Lamb Mobile. We had a great Dayton Hamvention. Uh, two new radios that we were showing there being the ID4100, now the R8600, which, by the way, we've got to the shortwave station, so we get mm -hmm. a nice look at the spectrum scopes that Gordo was talking about earlier. And hopefully... Late August, September, we'll have the 7610 that Val thought this originally was earlier. Yeah. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing the 7610 when when that gets out in the wild. Yes, sir. Uh, but, I mean, we're, we're not going to get into detail on these radios tonight because we're going to shoot some detailed video of it, and I'll let you know where you can find it once it's been posted. Yes. But that is... It looks about the size of a 7300, but that's not just the receiver out of a 7300. There's a lot more in that box. Now, there's, that, there is a lot more. It's a direct sampling HF through 6. Then there's a, a couple of down conversions to do VHF, UHF, and it goes all the way up to 3 gig. Wow. Oh. And, and we did just start shipping these last week. So I got to play with the prototype for a couple of weeks back in March. But uh, you got to touch it before I did. And I noticed there's drool stains all down the back of it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, maybe it won't rust. <laughs> no, it's a nice looking radio. And it's it seems very familiar to me. You know, the way it operates is. It's right along the path with the other ICOM rigs. That very, I've very similar, but one of the real cool things about it is there's a, a an Ethernet jack on the back of it, so you can have it remote somewhere and do IP control as well as the audio on it. So it's it's a very exciting radio for us. Yeah, we're looking forward to learning more about that. You've been on the road. Do you have? You know, I didn't get the chance to look at your mobile. Haven't seen it yet because. <laughs> Well, it's right up the road, not well, too far yeah. from here. Do you have a station in there yet? I've got a 5100 on a dash. Did not get a chance before we had to leave to install the 7100 and the AH4. I do have a 7300 in there as well. Uh, Radio Waves was nice enough to send an antenna. I was hoping to do field day in Petaluma. Sent Leo an email saying we're going to get there, but... The mountain range was just tough on a on a big bus. Oh, and you are you are on a big bus. You've what what kind of vehicle is that? 
It is a Winnebago. It's 42,000 pounds, so we couldn't get on a Natchez Trace. They, the, <laughs> the ultimate weight limit on it was 40,000. Wow. But we got to be careful where we go with it, not to crush any uh, any culverts or anything like that when we're going yeah. over driveways and, and not sink too deep. Wow. So are you enjoying it? I'm enjoying Life it. On the road. I'm enjoying it. My wife's not too much because we've had a <laughs> had a few little episodes, but growing up in a body fender shop had and mechanic shop allowed me to understand a lot of the things that goes on on the bus. So uh, we stopped in Tucson, Arizona, had some work planned done to it, but we're trying to get out of there to get out here to see family for the Fourth of July. And they forgot to tighten one of the solenoids for the hydraulic pumps. Oops. After about two quarts spilled on the ground and cleaning all of that up, found out what had happened and I had to do an infield repair. So, wow. But got it on the road and, and running. Uh, really hasn't gone through the schedule that we really wanted to, but it's starting to shape up pretty good. Uh, I've done. I mean, if Dan's on the, in the chat room, I'll be up in Oshkosh with him and the guys. I think I arrive up there on the 19th of this month. Mm -hmm. But doing sales calls uh, here in Mississippi, down in Louisiana, going to catch a couple of ham dealers up in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. So getting around and, and staying busy doing work. And then after Oshkosh, we head down to Dallas and start looking for a QTH. Yeah. So you've just been mobile, well, for several weeks now, I guess. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, well, sounds interesting because I, I know you travel a lot anyway. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm gone usually 50% of the time traveling somewhere by airplane. Now I'm in a little bit more convenient area that the commute to get to the East Coast is a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. It's a two to four hour flight, depending on where I'm going, where before it was just four hours to get to Dallas or to Chicago to change flights to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah so that that's good. That puts you in the center of the country, more or less. Biggest yes, airport in, in the center of the United States. So uh, I suspect you can fly anywhere there is to go from Dallas. Yes, and it's also a real quick car drive to Picune, Mississippi to take uh -huh. care of that that guy down there that yeah. he does a little <laughs> trash talk every now and then. Yeah. That's right. I know the guy. I just, I you know just ride around the corner, you can come down here and just jerk my chain right into submission. Anytime you want, buddy. You just come on, bring it. Bring it. Bring it. Bring it. All right. Bring a radio. Bring a radio when you come, okay? <laughs> Yeah, too bad you won't be at Slidell. That's coming up oh, a couple of weeks, maybe. Slidell yeah, the 15th. Slidell, the 15th. Slidell, yeah, that's, and okay. Yep. And Tyler's testing for his tech. Too. Yeah. Tyler's testing for his tech in Slidell. Oh, okay. okay. I will have the cheap old man be on the lookout for his first rig, Don. All right. Oh, he's, get, he's getting one of the uh, ID51s that I have. I have two 51s, so he's getting, uh, he's getting the black one that I have that I bought from uh, uh, our friends uh, up, in, uh, up in Paris, Texas a couple of years ago. He's only getting one radio, Don? Well, um, you know, he'll be a technician. He can operate 6 and 10 on this 7600 sitting here anytime Sounds he like wants. like another cheap old man to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I work for iHeart. <laughs> it is I'm in radio. I have yeah. no money. <laughs> well, I tell you what, let's get a quick message now. Speaking of money, let's pay a few bills here. Come back. We've got some stuff to give away. Let's let's talk about that. And then we'll visit a few more minutes and move on. All right. Start this year's contest season with ICOM. Heard it, worked it, logged it. The time is now to get your contesting equipment. Let ICOM help you make as many contacts as possible. Start off strong in the contesting this season with the IC7300. Ideal for the ham on the go, it's a high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with compact design, RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Use the IC7851 and get the most out of contest season. Raise the bar and hear what others cannot with this HF 50 MHz transceiver. 
reciprocal mixing dynamic range, crystal clear local oscillator design, spectrum scope, dual receivers, and digital voice recorder. The ICOM America Hams to Japan sweepstakes is coming to an end. There's still time to enter for a chance to win the grand prize, an unforgettable experience to attend the 2017 Tokyo Ham Fair. The drawing for the grand prize will take place July 17, 2017. For more information on all ICOM radios and contests, visit icomamerica.com slash amateur today. Thanks, ICOM, for sponsoring Ham Nation. You know, you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Learn how you could win in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio and also register to win some swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. Uh, we've got a winner. You know, the prize for June was going to be the ICOM IC718 HF transceiver, a great entry-level HF transceiver with big rig features. Our winner, Clark K5LGX. Congratulations, Clark. We know you're going to enjoy that. We've got another prize for July, and you want to go register for it because – I've got one sitting right here on the bench tonight. It's the ICOM ID4100A dual band transceiver. It's an entry level D Star mobile with big rig features, built in GPS receiver, full dot matrix display, micro SD card slot for voice and data storage, available Android and iOS application. And of course, it does both analog and D Star operation and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this and each episode of Ham Nation and register to win. That's icomamerica.com slash hamnation. Sign up, good luck, and don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but there's also a big contest that's about to come to a conclusion, right? Tell us yes, about sir. that. Yes, it, sir. It's the Hams to Japan contest, and it's... The grand prize winner gets a trip for two to the Tokyo Ham Fair. And if you haven't been to that show, it's spectacular. I bet it is. I mean, it's it's very club and ham oriented where Dayton has a lot of the forums. They have the forums as well. But each of the different unique areas in ham radio, they each have a table to explain about what they do and the the hobby. Wow. And that, that was the first time I went there, it gave me a good idea that while we say ham radio is just a hobby, it's really 50 different hobbies just under yeah. one name. Wow. That, and, and size, scope, how big would it be, say, compared to Dayton? Half the size physically? Physically, it's it's smaller it's mm -hmm. all under one roof but uh attendance wise it's much larger really yes sir wow and as far as the toys probably the best toys <laughs> that uh, you it's find. where a lot of people show the the new things and if you see something new there from icom if it's under glass it's going to be one year wow so we'll we'll see a prototype that will be where no one can touch it but then one year later there's a good chance it'll be ready for people to pick up. So the 7610 was introduced there. So fingers crossed. Okay. Sounds good. So how can they win? You know, I mean, you hadn't got long to register. You said the 17th is 17th the is drawing. when they're going to be doing the drawing. It's icomamerica.com forward slash H2JA for Hams, Hams to, to Japan. Japan. Okay. And just fill out that information on there to, to enter it, and it's going to be a random drawing. Okay. Sounds like a lot of fun. So you don't, you're not going to chauffeur them, though. You're going to let them actually have fun. They don't let me in a, on the pa driver's side of the car. Okay. Because <laughs> it is a long drive. It's on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you mean drive them over there? No, sir. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, we're, we're looking forward to hearing who wins that and – and hearing back from them afterwards what they thought of the Tokyo Ham Fair. All right. That's got to be a, a great show to attend. Well, anything else we want to talk about? I know we're going to be back toward the end of the show here to answer a few questions, but um, anything you want to mention before we move on? Not that I can think of other than I think Tommy's going to beat you on your ID 880 with the 4100 again. Now, you know, Ray, this one... 
this one has colors and it really you know i'm i'm the one who uh, who likes the rigs with the colored display Okay, so you're grasping at straws there because right now it's one to one, but I think he's going to win this one. Well, I mean, you know, that one's got well, th it looks a lot like uh, ID eight eighty eight that I got, but uh, there's a lot more under the hood there. Yes, it is. Well, I got something I want to give away here, and um, <laughs> well, I got two somethings I want to give away here. One, as a matter of fact, I've already given it away. Let me tell you. Who won this? I, I had asked a question. You know, Bob was talking about the preamp last week. Uh, he had built the preamp, put the filters in it. He he wrapped up his coverage of the pine board preamp project. Oh, cool. You know, he's using a 12AX7 tube in there. And I asked the question, who developed that tube and what year uh, was it done? And I, I got a winner here. It's uh, Dennis Mulliken. N6 DGM, he said that the 12AX7 was developed by RCA, and it was released for sale in 1947. It's before my birthday. Uh, mine, too. And, you know, that's probably one of the most popular tubes ever. I mean, it's still in a lot of guitar amps uh, all over the place. Oh, good. So uh, they, they hit a home run with that one. Well, Dennis, congratulations. We're going to send you, or actually DX Engineering are going to be sending it to you because I'm keeping mine. It's a DX Engineering sport bag, a great bag to, well, take to the ham fest, do whatever you'd take like to. Take to the bus with. with me. I always carry it uh, to the ham fest with me. <laughs> uh, no, Ray, that's not yours. I think I can fit both those radios in that bag. No, no. Uh, I'm not sure you can. I was afraid you were going to give away the slightly used Gordon West general class book, but I'm no, glad you didn't. No, I'm going to give them a brand new one. This this one is, um, well, this one's got some bent pages in it. And as much as I like to give away Gordo's books, you can also see there's a bunch of flags in here. Gordo flagged this copy especially for me to read questions out of to to give away things on okay. animation. And, well, this is a general class book. Gordo's general class amateur radio exam. It's uh, from Master Publishing. Uh, W5YI has these. Any ham radio dealer is going to have this book here. Uh, it's a really a great aid to use when you're studying for your general exam. By the way, uh, Tommy and I on Ham College just started uh, first episode on general this past episode. So uh, we actually referred to uh, Gordo and his book here on one of the answers we were unsure about, and he had the answer for it. Of course, we knew he would. Yeah. Well, here's this month's question, or actually this week's question. When sending CW, what does C mean when added to the RST report? Is it chirpy and unstable? Uh, report was read from an S meter rather than estimated. 100% copy or key clicks? What do you think? If you add C to the end of RST, what does that mean? Hmm. If you think you know that, send your answer to me at hamnationcontest at gmail.com. And you might win one of these right here. It's a MFJ Guardian Angel Surge Suppressor. It's got a little gas tube in there. We've shown you these before. Put it in line with your coax. Hook a ground to it. You've seen these, haven't you, Ray? Yes, sir. And pretty helpful for out here. Oh, yeah. It helps keep down uh, static uh, discharges and such. Drains them right onto ground because it'll jump across that uh, gas gap in there. Uh, protect your rig. They're available in a variety of different connectors. Well, this one has a SO239s, but they've also got them with BNCs. Uh, there's different power levels of it. Uh, they're available. Oh, gee, it depends on the band you want to go, but I think up to legal limit. So uh, a great little aid there to have to protect your radio because, you know, that's an investment. So uh, great little addition there. Hamnationcontest at gmail.com. Send your answer to me. Tell me what putting C at the end of RST means. Well, now I think it's time 
who are we going to throw it to? We're going to throw it to Don because we don't know what the news is. We're not sure he does, but we're about to find out. Not really. But, you know, I, I told Tyler as a little bit of incentive to get his uh, ham ticket, which he's testing for on the 15th. Um, I was going to give him an ID 51. I mean, you that's a that's a very, very good uh, first radio for for any ham. But as a little bit of incentive to uh, to uh, to be careful with it, I, I told him that I if he breaks it, I have a spare. So there's the spare. Just <laughs> a little out of the incentive. Nothing uh, wrong with a bowfang, but you know when you have an ID fifty one, you want to hang on to it lest you have to uh, resort to uh, something uh, a little less technically uh, enhanced. Mm -hmm. Why don't we go ahead and get to the uh, the news of the week from Amateur Radio Newsline while I try to figure out how to program this thing? From Amateur Radio Newsline report number two thousand seventy. These are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, July fifth, two thousand seventeen. New Zealand has more than just the America's Cup to be proud of. The nation has its own first satellite, KiwiSat, and it's just about ready for prime time. It needs a few more team members to see the project through. And if you're in New Zealand, you can help. The amateur radio satellite is at its staging point, ready to transport a payload of big hopes and dreams for New Zealand's ham community as the nation's first satellite. The on-again, off-again project has suffered from a variety of obstacles over the years, but AMSAT ZL is hoping to get it into orbit at last. Organisers have been collecting names of KiwiSat members and other amateurs who have stepped forward to serve as launch coordinator or part of the support team working with the coordinator. There is already an engineering team prepared to move forward, so the priority for now has been to conduct environmental testing of KiwiSat and then tend to the details of launch timing, coordination and funding. The project has also been in search of a new leader of the engineering team who can take up the reins from Fred Kennedy's at l one byp who has stepped down due to medical issues. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF. Does ham radio belong in a museum? Well, some kids in Tennessee would say yes, and not because amateur radio is a relic. The local children's museum is where radio comes alive for them. Youngsters in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, who got on the air for ARRL Kids Day had QSOs that were true museum-quality contacts. That's because the kids, who ranged in age from 4 to 11, were operating from inside the Children's Museum of Oak Ridge. Every third Sunday afternoon of the month, the Oak Ridge Amateur Radio Club hosts its Amateur Radio Outreach Day for the kids, and in June, that happened to coincide with ARRL's Kids Day on June 18. The youngsters learned and transmitted their names in Morse code, learned a little bit of radio science, and then keyed their mics and got on the air. The event took place in the museum's Discovery Lab, a great place for kids to discover the magic of radio. Jim Bogard, KY4L, said the museum and the Amateur Radio Club have a long-standing relationship with one another and recently signed a memorandum of understanding that may eventually lead to a permanent amateur radio exhibit at the museum. Jim said the concept would include an operating amateur radio station as well as equipment used during World War II when Oak Ridge was founded during the Manhattan Project. Meanwhile, he said the museum and the ham club are looking forward to the next amateur radio outreach day for youngsters, which will be Sunday, July 16th. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Mike Askins, KE5 CXP. What's happening in radio scouting? Well, there's barely a month left until the National Scout Jamboree. And Jim Wilson, K5ND, president of the K2BSA Amateur Radio Association, is here with a preview. Our overall goal is to provide scouts exposure to amateur radio, explain what it is, how it is relevant to them, and provide an opportunity to try as many aspects of the hobby as possible within the constraints of the Jamboree. We're not selling amateur radio, but we are sharing it with a sincere hope that many will be favorably impressed or at least better informed. Ideally, a few will pursue it as a hobby or even as an inspiration for a career option. Our targets for amateur radio demonstrations are 10% of Jamboree participants. That's about 3,000. Radio Merit Badge, our target is 400 scouts. And ARDF Fox Hunting, we hope to see 100 teams compete in the course. We also will be operating a special event station with many amateur radio operators across the country and around the world seeking to make a contact with K2BSA. Propagation willing, we hope to provide that opportunity. 
For the rest of this week's Amateur Radio News, please listen to the full Amateur Radio Newsline report online on a repeater near you or on shortwave radio station WTWW at 9930 and 5085 kilohertz. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF, Mike Askins, KE5CXP, Jim Wilson, K5ND, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. All right, and uh, we don't have anything from Dr. Scove tonight. She uh, just getting back from vacation, so we'll uh, check in uh, with her next week and see if we can uh, see what's going on with the uh, solar report. I did, however, I went outside and I looked up and I saw the sun. And I said, well, there it is. So there's your, there's your solar report tonight. And then hello to everybody listening on the shortwave tonight, WTWW 5085 uh, and uh, 12.105 from, uh, from Tennessee tonight. Uh, Ted Randall and family uh, doing their best to keep that thing on the air and uh, uh, great people, great station. So uh, you can hear Amateur Radio Newsline on WTWW numerous times of the day. So if you ever miss it, on your favorite repeater, or uh, you don't feel like going online to grab it at newsline or arnewsline.org, you can uh, hear it on WTWW several times a week. So we uh, we thank them for their support of, of what we do with Amateur Radio Newsline. We thank DX Engineering for their support of what we do here at Ham Nation. This episode of Ham Nation brought to you by the good folks at DX Engineering. The IARU HF Championship is this weekend, uh, and if you want to be competitive, you got to count on DX Engineering to uh, make sure you have the right gear so you can stay on top of the contest results. Uh, make sure you grab a, a Heil headset. They're excellent. High quality, good stuff, lightweight, versatile headsets. They let you stay comfortable for hours of operating. Uh, microphone elements that deliver excellent on-the-air clarity, and that's what Heil is known for. The Heil headsets are padded for comfort. They're built to survive years of heavy use. They also carry headsets from Prime Radio, another fine product. Prime Radio gear is the same equipment used in pro surveillance and government operations. They're durable, they're lightweight, they're ideal for contesting portable or MCOM operation. No matter which way you go, make sure you've got a good quality headset. It will make you very comfortable and you'll be able to hear the stuff that you will not be able to hear without a headset. And maybe it's time to upgrade your key. Your CW Opel DX Engineering carries keys and paddles from Venture, Vibraplex, N3ZN, Kent, and MFJ. These keys and paddles are found in serious contesting stations all over the globe. They feature anvil-like reliability and precision operation. They're rugged enough for everyday use, yet their beauty and elegance makes them equally at home, displayed on a bookcase. Uh, and of course, uh, you want something to go underneath that paddle or key so it doesn't slide around your desk. Check out the DX Engineering Paddle Pad. It's like a, it's, it's like a mouse pad, specifically designed for your, your key or your paddle. Prevents it from sliding around your desk allows your wrist to maintain a comfortable angle to cut down on the carpal tunnel. They have two sizes. There's one right there. They have two sizes at dxengineering.com, and they are specific. Don't, don't just cut down an old mouse pad. Get you something that's nice that you know is going to work and work well, and they've got it right there from DX Engineering. So treat yourself to something like that. Two sizes right there available. Also, uh, don't forget the importance of a high-quality external speaker for your contest station. Yeah, we talked about headsets, but speakers are just as important. And the Phonema speakers deliver crisp, clean audio. It's critical for accurately copying and logging QSOs. A good-sounding speaker will also mitigate headaches and ear fatigue. The Phonema speakers have a modern aesthetic to complement high-performance contest stations. And DX Engineering also carries external speakers from Palstar, Icom, Kenwood, and Iezu. No matter what you get from DX Engineering, you know it's going to be good. And you know you're going to get it. Quickly, because DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Most orders placed by 10 p.m. Eastern time are shipped the same day. Proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering is helping you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7, 365 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. dxengineering.com slash hamnation. You're going to love them. Uh, great products, great folks, expert advice. Uh, Tim Duffy, one of the best DXers on the planet. Uh, great guy, everybody there, just from uh, from Tim on down. You're going you're to love doing business with DX Engineering, and you're going to make a friend. You pick up the phone and call him up there, I guarantee it. Let's go check out and see what Val is doing, because Val is uh, Val is visiting a, another big-time contest station. Val, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I'm in a beautiful 
Trivoli, Illinois. Uh, it's a very small town. I don't even think they're incorporated, are they? Okay. And uh, I'm joined here with Craig, Canine CT. Say hello. Good evening. Yes, hello to everybody. Uh, Craig's been licensed been, since 1967. He's uh, very into DXing and contesting. He's on the DX honor roll. He's got 2,925 band countries worked. Uh, that's quite a bit and um, in the challenge. And uh, he set up a an incredible super station here. And uh, we're going to show you a couple of pictures, uh, if you will, Brian. And uh, he, he's been doing a lot of de-expeditions as well. What de-expedition is this on? That one, I believe, we're at Coco Asylum. Okay, the TI-9. Uh, so there he is on Coco's Island, and um, and uh, he you kind of got started off back in college. Um, if you want to show the next one, Brian, um, doing with your college club, correct? Right, and actually, this is in 1973. Uh, several of us went to uh, W1AW. That's actually me operating at W1AW. The the guy with the mic, the hand uh, microphone, and the hair. Uh, yeah, I, like now, but I'm guessing there's bell bottoms down below yeah, that you can't see. Is. Uh, I think there's a couple more there, Brian, if you want to show those two. Um, yeah, there you That's go. That's actually that. at the college station uh, when I was 21 years old in 1973. And um, so, oh, yeah. field With day? my shirt off. got to yeah. be a field day. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Hey, sex sells, right? There we <laughs> right. go. I don't think we need. Now here, uh, you've been on quite a few de-expeditions, many with Jerry, I know. Yes. Now, uh, we've circled the ones that you've co-led, all those you've co-led. Now, the ones with stars were de-expedition of the year, right? Right, yes. And um, you've got one biggie coming up, right? Yes, we're look I'm really looking forward to Beauvais. Actually, we're really deep into it already, even though it's in January and February of next year. Uh, we've got some great leadership. We've got a team of uh, 20 you know, experienced de-expeditioners. And uh, this doesn't happen overnight, so you have to get all the gear ready. And I'm already, we've already got the computers purchased. I have to get them all programmed. We'll be programming all of the radios uh, at, right here at this QTH and then shipping them to Atlanta. The whole team is going to meet in Atlanta. Uh, K4UEE is hosting uh, a workshop for the whole team. And uh, we're going to go over all the details and get everything shipped, uh, well, tested and shipped. I've already even uh, tested 6-meter EME and the 2-meter uh, EME setups from here so we're getting ready so you're going to be on everything from eme all the way to 160 that's correct on a bunch of modes bunch, all the bands yes. and uh it's pretty remote as you guys can see on that map uh, circled with the blue pin the other pin red pins are where you've all been you've been so far so about how long is it going to take you to get there well it's going to take us quite a while because we're going to be on a boat so it's going to seem like forever after about a week um, but, but we might have close to another week before we are actually on the island um, but we've got a nice boat. Uh, we've actually, I, I understand as of yesterday or the day before they signed the contract with a very nice boat. Uh, so we should feel very safe. Uh, it'll hold two helicopters. We need a helicopter to get on the island. We're going to be actually uh, putting our stations on the top of a glacier. So we've got to be very careful and very safe because we don't want any, to lose anybody in a crevasse or anything like that. But we're going to be sleeping on ice. So it's going to be, we're going to be chilling in Bobay. Okay. <laughs> Sleeping on ice. Okay, that's interesting. Now, let's kind of show some pictures from uh, this incredible antenna farm we're at. And uh, there's kind of an overview. What have you all got? You've got 13 towers, is that right? Yes. In fact, we just added one a couple years ago uh, to this group. Um, but I start, the shack is to the right. And you can see it. There's a large building that's white, and that's kind of the antenna assembly building. And I store some things in there. And then there's a new shack just to the right of that. But all of the all of the antennas that are close to the shack are to to keep the attenuation uh, losses down. So 160 is far away. 80, you know, it, as you get closer, then it, higher it gets in the band, it's closer VHF, to the shack. VHF, right? This is just a view to Europe that you saw. This is an and EME. that one on the far left. Yeah, that's an EME array, and then I have a tower trailer I set up for like NAQPs and SS contests and that sort of thing. Um, that's uh, the tower trailer, and then in the far you can see the. Uh, well, the closest, the vertical one there is a VHF tower close to the shack, and behind that is a new uh, crank up uh, H. Uh, that's one of the, the uh, towers that you can crank up to 90 feet, and, and we that's use that. Step yeah, and as that? St another step IR, okay. step IR antenna. And um, and here's a look at the the contesting. You do you hold a lot of contests here, and that's just one side. We'll kind of give you a view of the shack when we go live when you when we go back on us in a little bit here, but. Um, there's another setup just like that right behind those guys. 
Um, so you can run four stations with a run and a search and pound. So literally eight stations going at once, is that right? Oh, yeah, you can do that. We've done multi-multi here, but generally we run what's called multi-two, which is, uh, I know it's hard to believe this, but the left side of that picture, those two operators are actually one transmitter, they're interlocked. So what they do is they interleave contacts and the transmitters are locked out, so only one can transmit. So we enter the multi-two class so we can have two on at the same time on different bands. So the station is designed so that we can actually be doing in-band contesting and not interfere with each other. So while one guy's on 20 running a frequency, the other guy's hitting search and pound stations on 20, right. but he has to time it perfectly so it does it, it locks it out automatically right. so he can't transmit at the same time the run guy is transmitting. Right. So it's a lot of lot involved there. And we're gonna kinda show you some of the guts behind a lot yeah, of this. Yeah, one comment about this picture, if you'll notice above above the station, above the amplifiers, notice how few wires there are. Um, that's part of the station automation, part of the equation. There's very few cables, very few controls. Everything is done as a client server. So when they're looking at their screen, uh, the, all the antenna switching just follows the radio. And here's a shot of what it looked like when you first set things up. And that's kind of an SO2R setup <laughs> yeah, back in the day. Yeah, that was an SO2R setup. And uh, that's using the micro ham accessories and things like that, which I used quite a bit at that time. Uh, those are Ellicraft radios. But you can see all the wiring that you had to do. But this is now the simpler now setup. Now it's cleaned up. And if you go to the next one, yes. it's now you can see what it looks like now all cleaned up. Right. That's actually an SO2R setup in the back of a Flux 6700. It's very simple. The box on the top is actually for a special receiving antenna uh, switch uh, that we that I use for like on low bands like 160. So, but that's how simple it is now. And um, so you can kind of see this here. We're going to kind of go live over here now. So hang on here, and we're going to turn our cameras. All right, how we doing? Okay. So you can kind of see behind here. Um, we've got all the rotors, right? You kind of want to kind of explain yeah. things here? Yeah, actually, yes. We, uh, I'll stand, maybe stand over here for a second. Um, these are all the rotors and all the stepper controls. And you can see where all the antennas coming down here and then all the, the lightning protection devices. And then they, all of these devices go into a USB hub. And up here is a computer that's used as a server. So everything is on a net computer network. And then this is an antenna switch, which is a 12 by 4 switch. And then down here is a... Uh, can, can you see this? Yeah, over here is a an antenna genius that's used for 8x2 switching, which I use for SO2R. These are high power filters, and uh, then a stack matches that allow me to combine antennas uh, within the shack for different contests. So the point of all of this is everything is here, it's protected for lightning, and then everything ends here in a server. So I use software that allows me to automate the rest of the station. But as you can see right here, you can control it, what band you're on. It automatically switches to the right bandpass filters. Uh, up here is all your rotor controls. You can, you can move everything right from your computer screen because it's all connected over there. So it makes it really simple. Right, there, everything's a client. So here's the radio and it just follows the radio. So when an operator sits down here, they're really just focused on operating. They're watching the logging program. They're watching the stations and making sure they're logging accurate. Instead of worrying about things at 2 o'clock, yeah, not reaching up, standing up, doing anything, they just focus. And then the operators take turns, so they'll switch, and then the next operator will sit, sit down. They can do everything right from the screen. Right. And I tell you, an, an aside of this is by having everything on the screen like this, it allows you to do remote radio. So with the... Uh, with the flex allowing with the remote, you can just, I can go home now to my house. This is not my house, this is a contest station. And I can just take this with me anywhere I go and I can operate here. So it's kind of neat. Yeah. So um, that's kind of a, a look here. I'm, I'll kind of give you a pan around here too, see if you can see this. And, that, and that's a new uh, flex amp up there. And um, you can kind of see, I'm gonna spin us around here, see how good this goes. So we got more. That's all VHF here and EME. Yeah, and then over here is EME. Um, oh, right. EME is way over here. Yeah. There's Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And another station over there. <laughs> so, 
so we got forced and then we're full circle here. Yeah. So um, pretty cool setup. Uh, a lot of antennas, a lot of hardware, but um, it's pretty nice. Sorry, a little shaky there. Um, so, and I think, did we show the clean? Yeah, we showed the clean. So um, next we want to talk about, you have something cool coming up for college stations, correct? Well, we're going to try something. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that like the NAQP contest. In fact, there's one coming up in just a couple of weeks, the NAQP Ready. And then in August, there's the phone in CW. And we're going to be announcing this, but we're going to have a collegiate championship that will be a, co a contest within a contest. We're going to have it in January and have college stations compete against each other within that contest so that we'll have college. Well, this will, should attract young people because we're going to do online scoring. It'll be live scoring. It'll be four hours only. And uh, we hope other contesters and hams will help their local colleges get on the air and participate in this, and we hope to get more young people involved in, in amateur radio contests. Now, any uh, college stations out there want to learn more? What's the best place to figure well, out? We'll, we'll actually put information on the AWRL Collegial uh, Facebook page, uh, and I've got the information prepared. Uh, we just haven't released that yet, but it'll soon be And there is an article coming up on this yes, in the NCGA, in National Contest Journal. And uh, speaking of contests, I know we got this weekend the IARU HF Championship that's coming up uh, Saturday and Sunday. And um, that one, you actually, the multipliers are the zones. So you can work each other uh, and the HQ stations. So it depends on the distance and continents and zones, uh, whether you get one, three or five points. But uh, it's that one's a lot of fun. And it's phone and CW, mixed mode. So uh, a lot of chance to work a lot of people. Also, uh, not this weekend, but next weekend we have the NAQP ready contest, but that won't be available for the collegiate yet gotcha. to January. Okay. And then uh, at the end of the month, uh, you IOTA chasers, there's the big IOTA contest, uh, July 29th and 30th. So, uh, um, so if you want to learn more about Craig station, you have a website, don't you? Yes. K9CT.us. Thank you very much, Craig. Yeah, thank you very much, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to head over to you, Amanda. Well, thank you. Uh, and before you let Craig go away, my first question is for him. Um, first of all, which mode is better for VHF, UHF, DXing, FM or SSB? Well, I would say SSB by far, but I got to tell you, this year has been amazing because the digital mode does have taken over almost all of DXing on the VHF bands. Uh, JT65A in particular uh, has uh, just taken six meters by storm. So you need to check that out. It's been uh, spectacular. I I have not seen so many ham stations on that mode and as many people operating as I have this, this year. So and I'm gonna ver verify that because when I, I keep N3 TUQ up and it shows six meter spots. And when I see something spotted from like my area going into Europe, I'll, I'll you can click on it and it, it's nine out of 10 times it's JT65. So I'm gonna have to get that installed and I'll probably hopefully do a, a thing on how to do that for you guys. But uh, I, I concur. Yeah. I would love that Val. And I agree because I go on six meters and I'm looking around 5125 and I look on this wonderful 7600 that I have and I see the waterfall and up there about 268 is where all the action is. It's a huge line that is just filled up and I think it's all JT65. So that's pretty cool. Well, thanks, Craig. Um, first, before I get into any other questions, I wanted to show this last week and I didn't have a chance. So you guys, this is what happens when you outfield day yourself right here. This is what happened. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys saw, I posted this on Facebook and Katie's a very good sport. Thank you, Katie. And it was a lot of fun. And, you know, the meth commercial, not even once. This is kind of like the before and after of field day. So, all right. Thank you, Brian. All right. Um, one announcement. Monument, Colorado. We have a mega fest coming up this weekend. I'll be there. I hope to meet a lot of our fans out there. I'll be walking around, uh, doing a little bit of shopping if possible. But mostly I'll just be out there to talk to everyone. So that's this Saturday in Monument, Colorado, 8 a.m. I think the door is open. Second thing, Gordo was talking about tropospheric ducting and how he had this way crazy opening out there in California. I want to talk about a little bit here in Colorado. We had a repeater system that has the same input tone as our output on our repeater system. And they were causing this huge loop on a repeater that was 325 miles away in Kansas. So same thing happened here. Pretty crazy. And that was on UHF, by the way. And I was a witness to it because I was driving 
to work. I stopped at Starbucks, was going to work in the morning, saw another ham friend, got on the repeater and said, hey, hello. And then all of a sudden I heard my voice again. Hey, hello. Hey, hello. It was really the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my life. So we finally had to shut down our repeaters so that that was no longer happening until the opening closed. All right, let's move on to some questions. Um, Ray, these are all going to be for you. First of all, Ray, are you going to the ham holiday in Oklahoma City this month? No, I will not be. I'll not be able to make that one. Oh, I think Don's going to be disappointed about that too. Um, let's see. Next question for you. Um, are you going to Oshkosh as a radio guy or a pilot? And if pilot, do you do much ham radio from the plane? I'm going up there just as a radio guy and just a fan of airplanes. Uh, as much as I fly all the time, I don't get a chance to to get my pilot license, but I got a lot of friends who do both ham radio as well as the uh, piloting. So I'll probably hang out most of the time out in the Warbirds area. Okay, well, very good. And it's really nice to have you on tonight. I can't believe George gave us like a 24 hour notice of this. I would have came up with so many other questions for you, but um, last one, and we weren't gonna let you get out of the room without getting a stern in your face. Any more news about the 7610? How's it coming along? It's coming along. Uh, we're hoping that we get to see it at the end of August, beginning of September, and then I'll be back down here with George to, to go through it and play around with it. That's great. And what are you guys going to be doing for um, amateur uh, TV, amateur logic TV? Are you guys um, just experimenting on some radios or playing some with some new modes? What are you going to be doing on there that we can catch? Well, we're going to be wrapping up what we did for field day this year, which was a little different. We normally go camp out in the woods, but with a tropical storm coming through, it just didn't work out this year, Ray. We uh, we operated right here in the shack, so we got a little Chickens. bit of yeah. Well, <laughs> we got it's it's kind of hard to stay in an air conditioned tent in a tropical storm. You know, you, you might run out of fuel and have to and run out of air conditioning. But anyway, uh, we're going to show a little of that, talk about a few other things. We did just release our uh, first episode of Ham College on the general question pool. And I tell you, Ray, those questions on the general pool are a lot tougher than they were on the technician pool. Yeah, they they do kind of step it up each time. And when you got a good Elmer like Gordo to help you with the book, that, that always makes it easy. And then watching you and Tommy stumble through some of those and just watch the discovery occur, it's <laughs> it's kind of fun to do that. So it makes yeah. it easier to learn it. Oh, I agree totally. And I don't know that I could pass the general or the extra again without taking some time to study up again. So I think a lot of us chat room, I'm sure you agree. Anyhow, that's all the questions I had tonight. Let me just go over where some of the nets are. Uh, we have the D-Star net on 14 Charlie. It's happening right now. I heard it in the background here. I'm about ready to go check in. And they have the DMR TAC 311 net going on. And on 20 meters, I do believe they're on 14 268. You, we have to be careful because a lot of the 13 colonies are still on the air. So it's a little bit tougher to find some frequencies out there. And check around 7192 for that 40 meter net if you don't have any storms in your area, which has been kind of brutal this last uh, week or so. Other than that, Don, I know you are driving tonight, scary as that might be, but I think you've done an excellent job so far. Oh, there you are. I saw you through the camouflage. Um, so it's over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, Oklahoma City is not that far from where you are. Are you, you going to make ham holiday? No, I was invited to. I'm sorry. Somebody is knocking on my window. Go away. <laughs> it's just Jeff. Yes, he is knocking on the window. I don't know what he's trying to tell me as a message. No, I was invited to go, but unfortunately I could not. We have a, a yeah. rally that we're doing um, on Aries event on the weekend before and being away from the dogs for 48 hours that weekend and having grandparents watch. I can't ask them to do it again the next weekend. Yeah. So, And we have a lot of fires popping up here. So you guys, if I'm seriously that. gone next week, um, please understand. It's just we answer to a lot of fires around here. So, sure. Oh, Jeff yep. wanted to say hi to radio. You guys say hi to radio. Oh, there's radio. radio. Hello, radio. Hey, baby. Okay. Right. That's all I have. Back Those to you, Don. Those ears. <laughs> Those ears. That's great. Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, what you do in the chat room is just amazing. You, you're you a huge part of this show, and we couldn't do it without you. I, I wish that we had more time to do the chat room, but unfortunately, it's got to come at the end of the show. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any questions for you. So. 
I know. It's the, na- the nature of the beast. But we uh, we appreciate you uh, you being here. And uh, so hopefully we'll get Bob back next week and uh, we'll get the band back together and we'll have more fun and everything else going on. So uh, in the meantime, go out and get the rest of those 13 colony stations while you can. I got the full sweep, uh, all 13 plus the two bonus. And I also worked the uh, 70th anniversary of the Roswell UFO incident uh, a special event over the long 4th of July weekend. So uh, I am a fat and happy boy. So with that, uh, I will say uh, good night for, uh, for the crew here. Uh, for Ray and for Val and uh, for our, uh, uh, our, our, our uh, I've, I've blanked on, uh, on where Val is. I am so sorry about that. There he is. Uh, uh, with there Craig, K9CT Craig. in Travoli, Illinois, near Craig, Peoria. Craig. I'm so sorry, Craig. I can't remember my own name half the time. And George, we thank you too. And uh, there's radio and Amanda and everybody else. So uh, uh, that's, for the that's whole- Delta. Oh, that's Delta. Oh, okay. I couldn't. I couldn't yeah, see. Yeah, that's She's Delta. Blocked, uh, it's okay. Blocked by the mic. Blocked Hi, by Delta. the mic. Right. Oh, Delta. Yeah. Smaller ears. Yeah. Yes, no, the ears are not. <laughs> very much so. All right. So for the entire Ham Nation crew, we're uh, we're going to thank you so much for watching tonight, and we'll catch you again next week. Uh, same bat time or same ham time, same ham channel. Let's say it like that. So uh, from all of us, good night. Seven three. We'll see you next week.